we have an exciting morning today. Why? Because we are starting a new series. A new series. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. And many of you know this. Okay? Basically, it is the first and the last. But what is important here, as I look at this wonderful photo, Alpha and Omega, knowing the God of love in the Old and New Testament. Would you like to know that? The God of love in the Old Testament and the God of love in the New Testament. My dear friends, basically you are going to learn a lot in the next couple of weeks because this is an important topic that we would like to share with you. There are three implications here as you and I go through this. Number one, God desires to be known personally. Amen? And many of us think that God is basically theoretical. No. He wants us to know him personally. Another one. God doesn't want us to just look at him intellectually. But my dear friends, it should be experientially. You must experience God in your life. When you accepted Jesus Christ some time ago, for many of you, you have experienced a fantastic transformation. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes, that's true. The second one is, God has many attributes. But the one that we need to know is that God is a God of love. He is a God of love, and some people do not feel it. They say, I don't feel God's love. They say that, I don't believe that God loves me. Especially for the many who are having difficulties today. But my dear friends, believe it or not, it does not change who God is. He's a God of love. And the third one is God is the same God throughout the Bible. Some people wonder, how come the God in the Old Testament seems to be very strict? Why is he a God of wrath in the Old Testament? Friends, you know, in the New Testament, he seems more patient and compassionate. And truly, we understand that there are, there are things that you and I, that we must know. Why? Because there are many reasons. There are many reasons why you and I will look at God in different ways. My dear friends, in this series, in this series, we will happily discover, we will discover that God is the same God throughout the Bible. Amen? He's the same God throughout the Bible. And that is why you and I should look at it carefully. In Jeremiah 29, verses 23 to 24, shall we read this together? Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That's what God is saying. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Friends, as I read this passage, and I'm sure many of you are reading this now carefully. Well, God is telling the people, wisdom will not save you. He's also saying, wealth cannot save you at all. Strength and might and power cannot save us. So don't boast about this. Don't boast about it. Boast about the fact that you know who God is. And that's important for us. Boast that you understand his character. Talk about him. That makes the big difference in your life. I would imagine that before you came to Christ, you never talked about God. You never talked about Jesus. But when you became born again, when you accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, things changed. Even your Words that come out of your mouth change through the years. Because 
We are tempted at every turn to boast in things other than God. We boast about our accomplishments. We boast about everything, but not boasting about God. That's unfortunate. May we see the foolishness of this and boast only in Jesus Christ. Amen? Only in Jesus Christ. We talk about him. We talk about him. And we should not be afraid to talk. We should not be embarrassed to talk about Jesus. I can, all, I, I can really tell you stories wherein you are in front of people. People who don't know Jesus. And when you talk about him, they are stunned. But it's you that makes it possible. Because you are a born again believer. Remember that God should always be our focus every day of our lives. That makes the difference. Isaiah 44, verse 6 says, and we read this together. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. Wow. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, last letter of the Greek alphabet. God is the same God from eternity past to eternity future. He does not change. Then he says, in Malachi 3, 6, I love this passage, and I'm sure you love this too. For I, the Lord, do not change. The last book of the Old Testament says this. And amazingly, this verse is in that portion wherein it always talks to us. You know, before moving to the New Testament, the, the Malachi is telling us so many things. The unchanging nature of God is referred to as his immutability. Immutability. This is God's attribute. That he is unchanging in his character. And my friends, he will not change. He will not change his will. He will not change his promises. For example, if someone changes, the change can be for better, worse, or neutral. That happens to us all. God cannot change for the better because he is perfect. Amen? Amen. He's already perfect. He will not change for the better. God cannot change for the worse because he is not bad to begin with. He is holy. And he cannot change in a neutral way like getting younger or older because he is eternal. Our God is eternal. Wow. In Revelation 22 verse 13 says... I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And this is what we are going to be discussing in the next couple of weeks. So many gods are there in the Bible. Is that right? How many gods are there in the Bible? But there's only one God as far as we're concerned. Amen? But we're learning. The Israelites... The unbelievers, the Egyptians, they believed in other gods, unfortunately. And just to show you a few examples of how his character does not change from the Old to the New Testament, let me share this with you. Now, I'm not going to go over all of this, but I want you to take a picture of this. I, take, I want you to look at this carefully and you discuss this amongst yourself at home. Because let me just talk about compassion, grace. The Old Testament says, Exodus 34, verse 6, The Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. In the New Testament, Titus 2, 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Same. Love, Exodus 34, verse 6, Abounding in loving kindness and truth. John three sixteen. You and I know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And you have other ones, other attributes, other characters, faithfulness, and he judges sin. Today we will review one of the most famous accounts in the Old Testament. And I'm sure many of you know this already. From this account, we will learn about God's unchanging character. 
and what that means to us today. And that account is this one. Who are this? Who are this? The Jews. The Jews who were now facing the sea. They had actually left Egypt. The liberation of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. Specifically, the Passover. And immediately, the resulting exodus. Friends, I invite you to watch Netflix, okay? I don't know, maybe go some movies, you know? Netflix, I don't know. Maybe some of you have watched it already. The series is called Testament, The Story of Moses. Have you seen that? Not manood yun na yan? Nagustuhan nyo? Okay. So, pwede na tayo mag... We can't stop here. <laughs> Napanood yun na yan. But our message today is this. Rescue and response. Rescue and response. What does that mean? These are two important things we should learn and we should embrace in our hearts. How God rescues us. How God rescued the Israelites. And how you and I can respond today. Because the Israelites also responded. But we have to respond differently. Rescue. The first one is the promise. The promise. And this amazing rescue begins with an equally amazing promise. Originally made to Moses. Not made to to Moses, but to who? What was their covenant? Where, who was it given? To Abraham. To Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. Are you following me, my friends? Are you okay? Don't fall asleep, okay? Don't fall asleep. Because this is exciting. This is truly exciting. The Bible says in 15, 5, Genesis, and the Lord took Abraham outside and said, now look, towards the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Oh, imagine many generations before the Israelites even existed. God already made a promise to Abram about him, about them. So God really is eternal. God is a God from the start all the way to the end, the Alpha and the Omega. My friends, Genesis chapter 15, 12 to 14, we will appreciate this even more. And when the sun, shall we read it together? And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed. How many years? 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve. And afterwards, they will come out with many possessions. This was part of the promise. What is awesome here is that it was given to Abram even before the Israelites had even gone to Egypt. But there would emerge a great nation. But it was so detailed, including the time that they will be enslaved. And along with the promise that God will judge that nation who enslaved them, who oppressed them, and even including the detail that they will come out from that nation with many possessions. So detailed is the promise of God. So detailed is what he tells his people. The same with us today. Isn't God awesome? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is awesome? Can we say, God, you are awesome. God, you are awesome. Yes. We cannot leave the sanctuary without thinking of God being awesome in our lives. Because he is. He is. I believe that we know that today, even before. But Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 to 14 says, 
The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and on all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. Can you see the picture? What's going on? Let's go further. Exodus chapter 2, 23 to 25. The sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning. God heard them. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Now, do you know how this could encourage us? Because this is such an encouraging passage. I recently received some disturbing news. Disturbing. And maybe some of you have heard, have heard uh, your own disturbing news. Discouraging. Very difficult. And some had to do with people's problems. It's always that way. And because we're pastors, how can we help them? And how can you, D-group leaders, help your members? It's not only the pastors, but D-group leaders. All of us. All of us here. We need to help each other. Amen? We need to help each other. And I was crying out to God for this situation. For these people. For God to intervene in their lives. But listen to this. Our problems may be great. But God's promises are greater. Amen? God's promises are always greater. So don't quit. I hear a lot of people say, I want to quit, Pastor. Times are so difficult. And it's happening to young people. Young people. It's amazing how this world has changed completely. Deuteronomy chapter 7, 7 to 8 says... The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The implications of what we just read is this. God did not save the Israelites because they were good people. Agree? Or even earn God's favor. He saved them because he chose to be gracious to them. He chose to love them. The only thing the Israelites did was to humble themselves. And cry out to God in their helplessness. Much like you and I do today. We're totally helpless without God. Amen? If we're on our own, we're going to suffer. We cannot be on our own. We have to resort to the first priority, God. Unfortunately, many people make God the last priority. And even the last resort. Friends, the Bible tells us we are saved only by grace. Amen? Only by grace. The only thing we can do is like the Israelites. We have to humble ourselves. We have to admit we are helpless to save ourselves. And that we need God to rescue and save us. Amen? We need God to rescue us. So what did God do to set the Israelites free from bondage? Look at this picture. What happened? God sent the plagues. Amen? You and I know the story. You watch the Netflix movie about Moses and you will see the plagues. It's amazing. It's very clear. It's very clear. 
Maybe tonight all of you will run to Netflix, already watch it. That's okay. But it's amazing again. Each of these plagues were somehow judgments against the gods or idols of Egypt. Now, take a close look at this. Look at the plagues. All of this. Now, again, I will not discuss each and every one of them, but you'll notice it was geared towards making sure that these Egyptian gods, in my own words, will be put to shame. All of them. Look at that. Nile that changed the water into blood in the Nile. What happened? The Egyptian gods of this Nile, because of the water that flowed, is Apis, Isis, and Kulum. Kulum na lang, Apis, diba? But it's there. Look at that. The role of the gods. These are the roles of the gods. Again, take pictures. And tonight, have a devotion on all of this. We don't have the time to be able to discuss this, each and every one, much as I would like to. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night. Remember, this is the last plague. plague, And will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and the beast, and against them. All the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. In this plague, the last one, the tenth, God was teaching the Israelites a deep spiritual lesson that pointed to Christ even as early as that time. This plague required an act of faith. By them to save them from God's wrath on the idols of Egypt. It's interesting. It's interesting. Why? Because in the past, we never, I never looked at it that way. I was just a recipient of the Ten Commandments of Cecil B. DeMille, and I was happy with that. But as you and I study this plagues, this Exodus, then it becomes clearer to us and how it affects us today. My friends, the Israelites were also worshiping idols while they were slaves in Egypt. They were influenced. And like many of us, we are influenced by the world. Amen? And that's what happened there. They too sinned against God and needed deliverance through the blood of the innocent lamb. We will talk about that much later. How do we know the Israelites worship idols even while in Egypt? Look at what is written in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 20 verse 6 says, On that day I swore to them to bring them out from the land of Egypt into a land that I had selected for them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. It doesn't stop here. We look now at Ezekiel 20, 7 to 8. It says, I said to them, this is God, cast away each of you the detestable things of his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God, but they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So are you surprised that God's people were worshiping idols even while in Egypt? I'm sure we're not surprised anymore. Maybe we should not be too surprised. Why? Because after all, Take a look at ourselves. What idols do we have that we worship today? I'll show you. The 21st century idols. Again, take pictures of it. O kung ayaw nyo, sige, memoria nyo lang. What are the idols of today? Wealth. Tama ba yan? 
idolize wealth. We idolize possessions. We idolize fame and popularity, success, status, power and control, physical appearance. Diba? Physical appearance. Social media, validation, likes, career and ambition, relationships, romantic partners, the need to be right. And all of these other things are there. That is what is happening today. These are the 21st century idols. And these are just some of the reasons why you and I need to be rescued. So let's see how God rescued the Israelites and how it applies to us today. We will talk about the Passover. Rescue, Passover. And this awesome rescue begins with an equally awesome promise originally made not to Moses, but to Abraham. Again, I will talk about Abraham. The Bible says in Exodus 12, chapter 1, verse 3, up to 3. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregations of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. This is like their new year. When we experience being rescued by Jesus, forgiveness of sin, receiving his gifts of salvation, it is the start of a new life. Amen? A start of a new life. And I pray that all of us don't ever take that for granted. It is something we should never forget. It is something that you and I should always remind ourselves. And that is why it is important to be such. And we go to the verses, take a look at the details. Exodus 12, 5 to 6. It says, Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Take a look at the details that God himself taught. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Now, don't ask me why it had to be twilight. But at least it says here. And then it goes further. Exodus 12, 7 and 11. It says, moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Friends, as you and I look at what happened here in Exodus 12, 12 to 13, it says, I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and strike down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Are you okay? What is this? The blood. They had to put this. Because that was the instruction given by God. Remember, the part of the promise to Abraham that the Israelites would come out of Egypt with many possessions, God gave them details of this again. But this is more important now. My friends, to have the blood of the Lamb selected and slain in their place, in their house, and in this blood was to be smeared on the lentils of the doorposts of their home as a sign of their faith. This is a sign of their faith. Because the, God, the angel of death would not enter that home but would pass over. Friends, it's amazing how all of these things are going on. Exodus 12, 35 to 36 says, Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. For they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their requests. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. 
an amazing fulfillment of the promise to Abram, including the taking of possessions from the Egyptians. Are you following me? Are you okay? Think about this. Think about what God is doing. Think about what God is doing to us today. Exodus 12, 37, 40 to 41 says, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot aside from children. Would that be more if you look at the women? Would that be more with the children? Right? Lalaki lang ito, 600,000. So they say, commentaries say that this was run about 2 million plus that left Egypt. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. What a rescue. But it was all made possible because of this. The lamb, the Passover lamb. And more than just a means to free the Israelites from bondage to slavery, from bondage to slavery, thousands of years later, God provided the means to free us from the bondage of sin. That was through Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. When did Jesus die? Matthew 26, 1 to 2 says, When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Have you noticed the continuation? The Passover lamb of the Old Testament to the Passover lamb who is Jesus in the New Testament. Humanly speaking, Jesus could not have orchestrated his death on the Passover. He could not say, hurry up. You have to arrest me and kill me now. He didn't say that. This was divinely orchestrated. And look at just a few parallelisms between the Passover lamb in the Old Testament and Jesus Christ. Again, you will see this. Passover lamb chosen on the 10th day. Jesus Christ. Jesus entered Jerusalem the 10th of the month as determined by some scholars. Passover lamb was unblemished. Jesus was sinless, perfect. Passover lamb was male, very specific, male. Jesus took the form of a man. He was slain on the 14th day. This is the Passover lamb, eve of the Passover. Jesus was crucified on the eve of the Passover. What a coincidence, all of this together. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing, brothers and sisters. And this is all divinely orchestrated. Shall we give God a big hand on this? But how do you and I respond to this Amazing rescue. How? Well, the first thing is to remember and give thanks by celebrating the Lord's Supper. And today we will celebrate the Lord's Supper again. Okay? Remember last week we celebrated the Lord's Supper? Do you remember? You don't? We had the Lord's Supper last week. Today we will again celebrate the Lord's Supper. May I have them? Thank you, Pastor Joby. You're so kind. Is he kind? Yes. What did Jesus say on the last night of his life that we commemorate even up to this day? I'll show you. Luke 22, 17 to 20. Let's read this together. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. 
For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of their dead Eden saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant of my blood, in my blood. We have to learn. We have to learn that the, the, that the Lord's Supper was instituted and never to be forgotten. Look at what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 26, 27 to 28. I will, just, I will just read it to you, okay? For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So before we eat the bread and drink the juice, let us reflect for a few moments and confess our sins. We need to be right with God. So I will give us, all of us, two minutes and reflect. Have I done anything wrong that would cause God to be concerned about us? Let's pray and let us confess. In Luke 22, verse 19, it says, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. And in the same manner, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us partake of the juice. Father, thank you for your, how you have instituted the Lord's Supper, the celebration of your death. Lord, you have told us to be reminded of it always until you come. And Lord, thank you that we can reflect on what we have done that is abhorring to you. We ask for your forgiveness and we thank you that you forgive us. Thank you for your son, Jesus, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And this is Jesus who did it all. Thank you, Lord, for our time to commemorate the Lord's Supper. As collectively as we can, we thank you for this wonderful celebration. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our response now is our purity. This is a fitting response according to the Passover story. Exodus 12, 14 to 15 says, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it, celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Why did God have the Israelites eat unleavened bread? Bread without yeast. Well, the most obvious reason is that they were in a hurry. 
they did not have time for the bread to rise. But there is more to it. Why did eating unleavened bread become a permanent ordinance? And this is explained to us. Why did God say to remove all leaven from your houses? Even in the Old Testament, leaven or yeast was a symbol of sin. Friends, in the New Testament, we will understand the spiritual significance of leaven or yeast. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6 to 8. This is explained now to us. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Friends, remind yourselves, even in the Old Testament, leaven represents sin. This was carried over into the New Testament. These verses remind us that sin can start seemingly small, very small, but eventually has a large impact. Would you agree? It starts small. It starts small. Just like some small compromises can lead to blatant sin. That is why the pastors of CCF do not let women who are not their wives ride in their cars. So don't castigate those pastors who say, I'm sorry, I cannot have you in the car. Do not go to the And Another is, that is why you should not bring your phone into the bathroom. Maybe some of you are saying, Anong ginagawa ng phone sa bathroom? Yung nga eh. Why should we aim to live a pure and holy life? Why? Because Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. The apostle Peter wrote this. 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 to 16. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to your former lusts, which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Brothers and sisters, ask yourselves today, I'm not going to ask you, are you living a holy life free from the lust of the past? Think about it. But you and I cannot live a holy life, a pure life on our own strength. We need to depend on God like David did. Listen to what he wrote. Psalm 139, 1 to 3, 23 to 24 says, Shall we read this together? O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the day of everlasting way. Now maybe some of you are saying, Pastor Vic, sobra naman kayo. Now I want to show you areas for personal purity. You can again take pictures. This will help you. Areas for personal purity. The mind. What we think about. What do you think about every day? When you wake up, what are you thinking about? While you're in the office, what are you thinking about? Wherever you are, what are you thinking about? Your eyes, what we look at. I praise God that my wife, Techie, will always look at what, where my eyes go. And I don't wear sunglasses. I don't like sunglasses. So, kitang-kita yung mata ko. Bakit tinitingnan mo yan? Wala. Madumi yung sapatos. 
Be careful. Ears, what we listen to. Music. Careful. The heart, what are our motives? Hands, what we do. Feet, where we go. How we spend our time, energy, and resources. All of these are areas for personal purity. And it is challenging. Amen? It is challenging. And the Exodus story shows us another way that we should respond to the love of our Alpha Omega God. This is our pursuit. What can we learn from this, from the Exodus story? I'll show you. Exodus 13, 21 to 22 says, The Lord was going before them in a pillar of, in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of, of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Imagine being with the Israelites. And when you travel by day, you follow this. Look at them. Look at that. And then in the evening, the Israelites never went anywhere unless the Lord led them through the pillar of cloud or fire. Amazing, right? God was with them every step of the way. Such excitement during those days. Exodus 40, 36 to 38, it says, Throughout all their journey, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when they were taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it in the sight of all the house of Israel. The question today for all of us is do we follow God? Do we open our Bibles every day? Do we meditate on the Word every day? Do we pray every day? Do we take time out? The Bible says to pray morning, noon, and evening. Do we do that? And I pray we do. Do we pursue Jesus like our life depended on Him? Because it does. It does. John 8, 12, Jesus says, then again, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. My friends, the challenge for us is do we pursue Jesus? And we pursue him because we experience his saving love. And want to please him by following him in everything we do. And I'd like us to listen to a brother who will share with us a brief testimony of his journey. And I praise God for our brother, AJ. Uh, greetings, brothers and sisters in Christ. I am AJ Eugenio, a dedicated father, devoted husband, passionate practitioner of the culinary arts, and most importantly, a renewed Christian and devout follower of Jesus Christ, our Savior. My parents, fierce intellectuals that they are, instilled in me the love for knowledge and learning. Wanting to follow in my father's footsteps, I took up philosophy and human resource development as my pre-law at, at a prestigious college in Manila. It was during this time that the seed of atheism was planted in my psyche. I would carry this belief well into my young adulthood, believing I was living fully and righteously. It was during this time when one of my philosophy professors posed the question, why does God exist? Having never experienced a close relationship with our Lord, I started contemplating this question. Eventually, I arrived at the conclusion that God existed solely for the benefit of weak individuals who were unable to solve their own problems or overcome the challenges they face in life. 
based on my readings and self-education, I came to believe that people created God as a convenient excuse. Then came the, the first true pivotal moment of my life. An unexpected illness left me bedridden for a month, rendering me unable to fulfill my academic requirements. Much to my disappointment, I had to leave college, unable to complete my degree in philosophy. The setback turned out to be a blessing in disguise as it led me back to my passion, the culinary arts. After graduating, I embarked on my professional cooking journey at a five-star hotel in Alabama. I swiftly climbed through the ranks, earning multiple promotions within a short span of time. I felt that I had made it. My ego swelled, and the milestone in my career further reinforced my belief that I had no need for God. As God would have it, I decided to transfer to a hotel in Manila after my stint at Alabang to further expand my professional credentials. To my surprise and frustration, however, I was made to start from the bottom of the kitchen hierarchy, despite my accumulated experience and previous accomplishments. Although my ego was wounded, I refused to accept defeat. As a member of the Creek Kitchen Brigade, I found myself working long hours doing menial tasks. It was here when I met my work partner, Jonathan Ampilocchio, or Ampi as I referred to him, a devout Christian. Ampi always used our time together in the kitchen to discuss his faith with me. I wanted Ampi to submit to my belief that instead of submitting to an imaginary God, we should focus on living our lives to the fullest, to leave behind a meaningful legacy. Despite my initial stubbornness and refusal to admit defeat, I began reading the Bible at night in search of passages that could help me win our daily debates. Initially, I viewed the Bible as mere literature. As I continued reading each day, the messages became increasingly clear, understandable, and undeniable. Eventually, in 2007, I mustered the courage to approach my uncle, a devout Christian, and one Sunday he picked me up and we attended worship service at CCF Alabang together. As I observed the service and listened to the singing and messages being communicated, I found myself wanting for more. Finally, after much thought, I made the active decision to join the church and attend on a weekly basis. My relationship with Ampi also blossomed. Our debates transitioned into Bible study sessions, and he took on the role of a mentor. I became further convinced that divine intervention was at work within me, especially since my father noticed a newfound sense of peace within me. Throughout my journey as a sinner, I have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. This path has been filled with numerous storms and challenges, which continue to this day. However, the significant difference lies in the fact that now I have a God whom I can rely on, call upon during my weakest moments, and find hope in the promises written in the Bible. Presently, I am employed as a culinary instructor, and I am grateful that God has provided me with the perfect platform to influence the next generation of professional cooks. In 2015, my wife, Daisy, and I started leading a couples day group. I have also willingly served as a cook for CCF Tulong Tayo. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that come to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I, A.J. Eugenio, was once a self-righteous unbeliever and sinner, but now I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I look forward to being part of his kingdom's brigade, preparing a feast for all his saints for eternity. All glory, honor, and praise belong to God.
Hang on, hang on. May I ask for Daisy and your daughter to come up here so we can pray for you? The congregation will pray for you. Alora, right? Uh, I called her earlier, Aloha. Hindi pala, Alora. You know, I was privileged that uh, uh, when um, both uh, AJ and Daisy got married some time ago, I was the officiating minister. And I praise God for that. How the time has changed. I didn't realize you were coming from an atheist background. Maybe I would have changed my mind if I... <laughs> no, but praise God how you have, uh, have grown in the Lord and how he has sustained you all these years through the different challenges that you have. Okay. Let's pray. Let's, uh, re- please raise your hands facing them. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the story that AJ has given to us that he has encouraged us about the past, that it has nothing to do with the future, and that you will intervene, and you will be there as, uh, as AJ did, to search for you, to know you, and eventually to accept you as his Lord and Savior. Lord, we have all these stories together that gives us encouragement, that even how difficult it is for a person not to accept you earlier, but as long as we pray, as long as we help mentor individuals such as AJ, AJ eventually came to Christ. And Lord, thank you for CCF that has become his home and for the people who are here today that has given him comfort, he and JC and Alora. Father, I pray that you will bless them, protect them, guide them, and be there for them every step of the way. And thank you, Lord, that you always are there to give your blessings upon people who want these blessings. And thank you, Lord, for his story. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And God's people say, amen Amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hindi halata, no? That he is a chef. Hindi siya mahilig kumain. Hindi. But again, today, what drives your life today? That is the question we have for you. Or better put, who drives your life today? My dear friends, is it you? Or is it Jesus? And AJ's testimony just tells us that if we put our trust in Jesus... He will intervene in our lives and change us for the better. It's amazing. Let me ask you again. Have you responded to the love of God who is the same in the Old and the New Testament? Have you responded to him? The God who has provided the way for you to be saved and set free from slavery to sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 15 says all this. Shall we read it together? For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all. Therefore, all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on on their behalf. What a passage. What a passage that changes our lives. So I pray that today, the message that we have for you, rescue and response, the alpha and the omega. And this is just the start. There will be more to learn the coming weeks. Are you excited? Really excited? Can we give God a big, big hand? (laughs) Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our time together in worship. Thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us, each and every one of us. And if we are struggling at this time, Lord, speak to us. 
And if we know anyone struggling, Lord, I pray that all of us here will come and help that person. Father in heaven, the world is decaying. But all of us here, as born-again Christians, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a task to do. To make people focus on Jesus. To make people know Him. And to make people respond. Lord, you have rescued us. And thank you for that rescue. And now we respond. We respond to the Passover and the purity that's there. Lord, we want to pursue you continuously without fail. And thank you, Lord, that you make it possible for us to enjoy your presence in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for everything. We ask again that you bless us as we go our separate ways. And thank you, Lord, for this Sunday that you have given us an encounter with you. And thank you for everything that you're doing. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen, amen and amen. Thank you very much. God bless you all.